Hope I don't fall. Hopefully the number of people who are here today will still be here on Thursday. Okay, all right. I have, I have, some, I have somebody to convince today, basically, is what you're telling me. Well, this might be, um, this is actually a series of papers. Um, two of them are under review, uh, Wednesday night and Thursday night. Uh, one has a second R&R, &R, uh, so it will probably will get published somewhere. Um, this paper, however, is in progress. So this is the spanking new, it's not really hot off the press, because in fact, uh, I wrote the first part of this paper as part of my dissertation prospectus at Indiana University in 2011. Um, it's been that long. Um, I know people don't read websites, but um, part of the acknowledgments that I gave in my dissertation was to the ICPCS, ICPCS, ICPSR summer program. Um, I feel like I got my PhD from here as much as I got my PhD from Indiana University, um, as much as I spent time in the University of Mannheim. Um, I probably spent six of the eight summers that I was in graduate school in Ann Arbor. <laughs> um, don't do that. <laughs> I'm just joking. You should do that. Um, so I'm excited to present to you a piece of the work that I'm doing on the political economy of race and racism. Um, this work is not about health, which is what most of my work is about. It's, it's simply about structural racism and how do we measure it. Um, it was in an ICPSR uh, race class. It was called Methodological Issues and Quantitative Research on Race and Ethnicity back in those days that I read a paper by Gilbert G. It was published in 2002. It was even at that time a little dated uh, and it said it claimed to be measuring institutional racism, but when I read the paper, I found out that there was an inverse relationship uh, between institutional racism and health, and that made me wonder whether the theory was wrong, whether the methods were wrong, or whether we were wrong. So what do you think should be the relationship between institutional racism and health? As institutional racism goes up, goes down. All right, so there should be a negative relationship between institutional racism and health. Don't care how you measure it. We're not concerned with that right now. But if you come up with a measure of institutional racism and health, uh, or institutional racism, it should be inversely related to be better health. And this relationship was not found. In fact, the opposite relationship was found in the 2002 piece in Gilbert G. So I called him up. He was at, uh, he's actually a former postdoc of Indiana, so I felt I could call him up. Um, <laughs> so I called him up and I asked him, what's, what's going on? And he said, you know, I don't know. I mean, I did the analysis like they told me to do it, and this is what I found. And, you know, I'm moved on. I'm not going to do this, any, this kind of research anymore. It's up to y'all to figure out what's going on. I thought I had a dissertation. I said, oh, man, I'm going to have a dissertation on measuring institutional racism. And then, literally, in 2011, Dara Mendez published a piece on institutional racism and how to measure it. <laughs> And I said, shoot, there goes my dissertation. So that was my prospectus, was how to measure it. Um, but then I actually had to do the dissertation on how to properly or how to, if we expect a negative relationship or a positive relationship, sorry, a negative relationship between institutional racism and health, what types of measures should we be looking for? Um, what I'll present to you today is uh, a little piece of that. So there's two parts of this um, lecture today. First, I cannot 
have a conversation about methods unless I have a conversation about theory. Um, so for those of you who uh, have never taken a race class, how many of those have never taken a race or racism class? Okay, this is for you. All right, how many of y'all have taken a race and racism class? This is for you too, <laughs> all right? The overarching lecture is basically the promise of nested models for critical studies of race and racism. Um, I'm not gonna lie, there is nothing special about nested models, except that I love them. <laughs> I mean, I really, really, really love them. And when I started to learn nested models, I actually learned it in a longitudinal data analysis class. And when I realized that there were both fixed and random effects in longitudinal data analysis when I was running growth, growth curve models, I said, whoa, wait a minute. What if time and space could move at the same time in our analysis? I got super excited, but I hadn't taken a HLM class yet or um, a formal kind of organizational unit and its nesting structure class yet. And I did not take that for another year. And it was actually a prerequisite for me getting the data set that I used for my dissertation, which was called the Project of Human Development in Chicago, Chicago Neighborhoods, which was at that time the only data set that you could use to do um, a true neighborhood effects model. When I say a true neighborhood effects model, what I'm referring to is when you sample randomly the neighborhoods in your study, your higher level of unit, and then you sample again within those areas, the people. Most people and most analyses that you see that are using multi-level models is really a random sample of people that we have geocoded information for. That's not a neighborhood effects or an area effects study just to blow your gasket right there. Um, but if you go back into some of the, the formal models of neighborhood effects research, and there's at least uh, some, they were talking about the early 90s here, um, they really spell out very seriously that you need to sample neighborhoods and cluster people, enough people in neighborhoods to be able to disentangle between unit and within unit effects. And in fact, that's really all I have to say to you right now. I could go home, and if you've learned that, you've learned everything you need to know to run half of the models I'm gonna show you, all right? Now, you may run them, but you may not know what to do with the analysis. And that's where I was um, in 2011. I had ran the analysis, I had ran, uh, there are two types of models that had been used at this time, the, the models by Gilbert G, the models by Dara Mendez. And then I started running some simulation models to see if I could figure out why these models didn't say the same things about health. Um, and why they were saying, and at least in the studies of Los Angeles and a study of Philadelphia, why they were saying opposite things about health. Um, so I tried a lot of things, but I couldn't figure it out. I honestly couldn't figure it out at that point of time. So I'm gonna give you an overview of, it's gonna be really quick, Racism 101, uh, Race 101. I'm gonna introduce a new term for you, ethnoraciality, which, which I had defined as an omnibus concept which uh, connects both studies of race and studies of ethnicity. And we don't have to go too far into it because for uh, statistical state, st uh, for statistical sake, there are just groups. Doesn't matter why they're groups, why there are differences, why they call themselves what they call themselves, they're just groups. I'll, you'll hear me use the language of strata. So this is within neighborhood strata. One type of strata that we have could be class. Another might be um, race, another might be ethnicity, and these happen to be the three strata by which people were selected into the PhD ECN study in Chicago. Now Chicago is a odd place to do these type of research because it's highly segregated. And that's one of the first problems I ran into actually creating a measure. The measures that Gilbert G and Dara Mendez used 
couldn't be used in Chicago because nearly all, 97% of the neighborhood clusters in Chicago would be considered redlined. So I thought I had a dissertation, then someone stole my dissertation. <laughs> then I said, wait a minute, I'm gonna still do this thing. And then I said, wait a minute, I can't do this thing. Literally, there's no variation. So what I had to do was create different measures of what I call resource deprivation, more broadly speaking, um, or just inequality. In the second part of that, I'll talk to you about uh, the, the, the concept that I use now, which incorporates three different types of, of racism. It's called supra-individual racism. If someone can tell me what that means right now, I'll skip that part. What does supra-individual racism mean? What does the term supra mean? Say it again. Someone said it. Above the individual. We're going to skip that part. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about prior studies uh, that did not use any type, of, uh, any type of effects. Really, they were using what I would call bivariate risk. Or you might want to call it a bivariate effect, but that would be I'll put an effect in quotes on that one. Um, I'll talk about, well, this is, the, this is how we're going to measure institutional racism today and tomorrow, but not on Thursday. Um, we're going to use a, a way of understanding housing discrimination, which is called neighborhood redlining. And then lastly, um, I'll talk about the two, how do you actually do the two established mixed effects models, and then I'll introduce a third one to you, uh, new, newish. Uh, what I found, you know, and I love it, but what happens across time is um, the statisticians work a lot faster than I do. So what I used to have to compute by hand um, some eight years ago, there's actually a there's actually like a program for it now. So it's not gonna be as difficult as I'm, I make it out to be, but I'm gonna talk about what the conceptual uh, thing is going on behind these models. So um, what are critical studies of race and racism? So this is important for you to understand. I am not talking about every study of race and racism here. I'm not gonna try to. Um, I'm gonna focus on three types of studies. The first one are studies that hold central to the role of racism in social categorization, either the fact that someone is or is not a particular race or ethnicity, and social inequality, that there are differences between two groups of people who are categorized by race and ethnicity. I'm going to focus on studies that explicitly name racism as a theoretical tool to understand a phenomenon, there's a lot more studies that name it than studies that do the latter. The last thing, which is operationalize racism in empirical models. Now, this is a little bit, uh, some caveats here. What I'm really referring to here is structural racism. I'm not referring to individual racism or internalized racism because there actually are a good number of thousands of studies that study interpersonal racism. Uh, another couple thousand that study internalized racism. There are not even a hundred that study institutional racism um, and structural racism. And I'm not going to even talk about systemic racism. All of those which are different concepts that have different ways that we would think about how to conceptualize them and operationalize them. So. In general, within these critical studies of race and racism, people believe that there is a link between racism, which most people think about as the engine of inequality within critical studies. So I put a little bite there. <laughs> the engine. But that engine is moved by people and their ideas about how people are different as well as it's moved by how people think people should have access to resources and mobility. How we get from racism to race is a thing we call discrimination, which is mostly 
uh, people's actions. People do things. Now, we could focus on any number of people who do things. Usually if we focus on the random uh, person in the public, we call that interpersonal racism. When we do it to ourselves, we call that inter internalized racism. But when an institution and an institutional actor, for instance, the police or teachers, when they do something to us, we call that institutional racism, okay? So we're gonna complicate this relationship by the end of the story because there are a lot of things that are between racism and race besides discrimination. And if we are properly me me measuring some of those things, not all of them, but some of those things, then we have to wonder why there still are, in most studies, racial disparities in a number of different outcomes when we control for even uh, interpersonal racism. So for, the, uh, for our lecture today, we can think about racism as a set of ideas or ideology or belief, as well as we can think about it as a, as a type of action or practice. And in fact, you have people on both, these are four different definitions of racism. The easiest way to think about this on the, as the ideology, an ideology that categorizes and ranks human groups with some being inferior to others. Uh, one thing that's missing here is to the advantage of the one defining and deploying these definitions and to the detriment of the one subjected to that act of definition. So there has to be something about the give and the take, not just the take, all right? Um, when we think about racism as action or, or practice, what well now we're talking about are both institutional and individual practices that reinforce oppressive systems of race relations, okay? Uh, we can boil it down to the unequal treatment or exploitation of social groups stemming from the racialization of a social relationship. The term racialization uh, is one that refers to something becoming about race, some difference becoming about a vertical worth of hierarchy between two groups of people. It's a difference between ethnicity and race, really. The difference between hierarchical, horizontal differences and vertical differences of worth and belonging. Um, here are your five different types of, 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 of racism. The last three bottom ones, institutional, structural, systemic, I referred to that before. Some of you may have or may have not heard about it. Um, here, generally, institutional racism refers to policies, laws, or practices of the institution that systematically disadvantage one group over another. Uh, structural racism, as I use it, this is not necessarily how a lot of people think about it. Most of the time when people are referring to structural racism, they're actually talking about institutional racism. They're referring to within an institution, resource deprivation systematically from one group of people. So one group is, de is, is denied access to employment or they're denied access uh, to education. That's actually institutional racism. Now, if we dig a little deeper into the literature, structural racism actually refers to interinstitutional interactions. So these are cross-institutional interactions across time and space that reproduce racial inequality. We can think about this such as the school to prison pipeline or the prison to labor pipeline or the prison to housing pipeline, all right? This is representing basically the linkages between institutions. Uh, systemic racism, I'm gonna go ahead and read this one just because the guy who came up with this term is actually one of my earliest mentors in, in, grad, in undergrad, uh, Joe Fagan, refers to a, divor a diverse assortment of historical and lifelong racist practices and vested group interest of whites to maintain racism encompassing daily microaggressions, deep-seated inequalities, and anti-black ideologies. Now, if I have, uh, what me and one of my graduate students are doing a review of the top three medical sociology journals, 
and nobody studies systemic racism. People talk about it, but nobody actually measures it because this is very difficult to measure. It generally requires for you to have a, some type of legacy a mo a covariate in your model or at least in your opera operationalization of racism. Um, and when we think about the study of race, go back, uh, we are thinking about several different types of categorizations. It could be race, it could be ethnicity, it could also be nationality and it could be re religion. All of these are included and they have uh, different types of social categorizations uh, that are constructed to be, uh, to mark one group as different from the other. So I've come up with a term, um, I think there's a missing, is there, it all comes after this, all right. So I've come up with a, a term or I've, I've jumped on the bandwagon of some folks um, uh, I'm thinking David Theo Goldberg, uh, who uses the term ethno race, um, but he uses it. He doesn't really go too much into it. He's a, a European-based scholar, um, and I want to kind of flesh it out a little bit more. There are we think about race and ethnicity. Sometimes we use them race slash ethnicity, race dash ethnicity, race and it means ethnicity and ethnicity and it means race. All right, well, I think that's poor conceptualization and we need to be more exact in our science as we would demand from anybody else for any other topic. Uh, race for me contains a judgment of value. It refers to signifiers, it reflects the power of others, external others to define and promote stereotypes of a group as natural. This second part really captures some part of the racialization process to define the difference between the group as something that is natural. It was just that way. It's human nature. It's genetic. It's biology. And as someone who studies health disparities, which is a biological outcome, it becomes really hard to toe that line between whether you're talking about race as a biological phenomenon or a structural manifestation of biological differences or biological manifestations of structural differences. They have very different meanings. The last two also very important, particularly the last one here, vertical hierarchies of worth. Uh, race emphasizes external processes of stereotyping and exclusion over perceived similarities and formation of group identification. Here in this one, these are more like a Venn diagram, right? Where more, more of the Venn diagram is capturing these external others and how they perceive the group rather than how the in-group perceives itself. Ethnicity uh, captures group characteristics that are defined at a given time in a given space, geospatial location. Um, and some of this does pertain to race, but Less so, some of our racial categories are very uh, sticky, shall we say, uh, versus ethnic categories. When they're changing like that, they're, they tend to be ethnic categories rather than race categories. Uh, you have signifiers that reflect external to the group and internal group processes of stereotyping and exclusion. So that Venn diagram would be more of an equal uh, overlap between the two, all right? and you have horizontal hierarchies of belonging. So each different pie, you can think about it as, I think about it as a timeline, honestly. And every year, a different, uh, represents a different ethnic group, right? Versus you have a ladder, and as you go up that ladder, the people on the top of that ladder have more power than the people on the bottom of that ladder. If you go across a timeline, there's no change in power. You may all be on one part of the ladder, right? So you can have within a racial category many different ethnic categories. This is something that has been very much muddied in the study of race and ethnicity in, um, and racism, frankly, um, for many years. And so this ethno-raciality category is there just to kind of get us cleared up. But ethno-raciality refers to the things that are the same for both race and ethnicity. The groups may share economic, social, cultural, and or religious characteristics. 
They may try to maintain group boundaries. There may be the formation of group identification based on the self or other perceived similarities among members of a group. And it may be ethno-racial group status may be the basis for mobilization or exploitation of interest. So there are many different things that you can, you can that come into this subset of what race and ethnicity is. For the purposes of today, it really doesn't matter what you're talking about. Whether you're talking about ethno-religious differences, ethno-racial differences, you're not looking at the same thing I'm looking at, um, ancestral groups, or you're looking at racial groups that are not ethnic groups. Um, because what we're thinking about here is this subset of groups, right? And we're gonna try to distinguish these groups. I'll be honest with you that um, most of the models that you'll see today are two group models. Uh, so there is a lot of room for development for talking about multi-group indices. There are some that are out there, I know. Um, they work more like uh, the, the, the Thau's Entropy Index or the Simpsons Diversity Index where they're looking at how different groups are from each other. Um, but there may be some room for development there as well. So ethno-raciality functions at the macro level, at the micro level, and beneath the surface. And beneath the surface is where I'll stay today because that's where we really don't capture. Beneath the surface refers to a system of meaning, okay? A system of meaning that is activated by and through institutions and everyday interaction. What, time, what oftentimes we, we miss in our understandings of racism, and particularly structural racism, is that it's not simply that one group is not getting the resources of the other group, or they're not getting access to an institution, but that these institutions, excuse me, but that these institutions are operating under a system of meaning about how different groups should be interacting together with their resources. And those, those meanings are written into the code of the institution. So you don't have to write no coloreds allowed here, no immigrants here across this wall. You don't have to write that anymore because it's written into the code of these institutions. And I think the, the housing industry, and particularly the mortgage market, is actually a prime example of that because it relies so much on two things that are very much shaped by race and racism. Money, and what's the second thing? Credit. But it's not the same. I wish, to t I wish if you had a lot of money, you always have good credit. And if you don't have a lot of money, you have poor credit. But they're not that easily tied together, right? Um, but money and credit are two very racialized constructs. And because the entire mortgage market system is based off of those two things, um, it implicates race without ever having to say, no, we don't want the black folks to have our money. We're not going to invest in black neighborhoods. We're not going to invest in black people. OK? So, um, so I'm referring to a paper uh, that was published in 2016. It's called uh, The Racism Race Reification Process and a bunch of other stuff. But all you should remember is the Racism Race Reification Process, which means RQP. It's a theoretical framework, a meso-level theoretical framework to understand how the macro level trickles down into the individual. And what you should remember from uh, this is this part here. The main thesis is uh, of how the process works is meso level race reification, where you have an ideology of race that produces distal political economic structures that are implicated in racial inequality by way of neighborhood context. So we have to start measuring the neighborhood context, and this is what you see here. The main uh, variable, and I won't stay, we'll come back to this tomorrow and a little bit on, uh, uh, on we'll, we'll be over it tomorrow by the time I finish with you. Uh, but the main thing is this concept of racist relational structures, which refers to insti uh, institutionalized treatment, treatment bias, right? 
And what you want to do is to be really clear when you're creating your measures about what form of treatment bias is codified in your measure. So I disagree with some of the ways of measure. We're going to get into the measurement part here. Uh, what time are we at? OK, we're at 37 minutes. All right, good. Um, we're at, uh, I disagree with some of the ways that structural racism is measured because I don't think it ha they have very strong theories of institutionalized treatment bias. They have measures, they have, they have strong theories of differences in resources, but not why there are differences in resources. Okay? Uh, so we skipped that part. I told y'all I was going to skip it because y'all passed that one. All right, so uh, one of the, the, story, one of the um, studies I, I do like, but also disagree with, <laughs> is um, this is a measure of structural racism. It's at the state level. They basically go into these various different data sets and identify black and white rates of being registered to vote, voting, state elected officials, civilian labor, popula labor population, and being employed executive or managerial position, professional specialty, bachelor's degree or higher, incarcerated, disenfranchised, and a death row. Um, most of these measures, what they have in common is they focus on uh, the person, the incarcerated, not who put the person into the incarcerated place. What's missing in judicial treatment? I have incarcerated, disenfranchised, death row. Who's missing? Judges. Judges, come on. Who's missing? Cops. Cops are missing here. You cannot tell me about judicial treatment when the first act of criminalization is whether someone issues you a sanction. There are many people who break the law and are never called out on it. I lived in neighborhoods like this. The police lived in the same neighborhood as I did. They did not police that neighborhood. I got away with a lot of stuff. <laughs> just joking, I'm just joking. Well, in this, this paper, they were looking at the outcome being, uh, the first outcome being myocardial infarct infarctions. They found that, so first it's a little difficult to read because not all of these measures go into the way that they should go. Not all higher measures of structural racism are linked to poor, are linked to bad things. Sometimes the structural racism measures are linked to good things, like black-white differences in executive managerial positions. If you have more blacks in executive managerial positions, that's good. So shouldn't you create a measure that reflects the lack of blacks in executive managerial positions? That's just a conceptual issue. But generally what they find is that structural racism, when it is associated with health, is associated with more myocardial infarctions for blacks and less myocardial infarctions for whites. And this difference in the effect is significant. Now here's the problem. These are run on different samples. So they're using a, wild, a walled uh, chi-square test to test the, the significance, the overlap of the 95% confidence intervals to see whether that, that odds ratio is in that confidence interval and this odds ratio is in that 95% uh, that confidence interval. That's what they're doing. But they don't actually, because of how they collected the data, I'm going to tell you another thing they're doing. Uh, because of how they collected the data, they actually can't run all these they cannot run all of these measures at the same time. They're highly correlated with each other. All right? So they're running separate models, one line, basically every cell that you see here, an odds ratio, a 95% kind of confidence interval, and a p-value is a separate model. Besides these last two, which is a, a, you're testing the, the, the chi-square distributions. This one is a little more innovative, I think, uh, because this measure of area racism is defined as the proportion of Google searches containing the N-word in 196 designated market areas. Anybody know what a designated market area is? 
It's a consumer market area. It's basically your television consumer uh, site. So when you move to a new DMA, as they call it, um, you get different commercials. All right, and then it, you know companies can buy. They can you can actually get smaller designated market areas than this. But this is what is publicly available. They don't have to ask anybody for IRB approval or anything like that. They can just go do the research themselves. They find that area racism, the more times that the, the higher proportion of Google searches that included the N-word was linked to um, higher rates of, of all cause, all cause mortality, holding constants, um, a range of state level variables, urbanicity, percent black, education levels, poverty levels, and even white mortality. So when they're controlling for white mortality here, what this is actually predicting is the racial gap. Because of how the data is structured, they can't actually measure that because the data is at the state, at the, the DMA level. They basically have 196 DMAs that are black, 196 DMAs, um, well, hold up, uh, one, uh, 196 DMAs, and for each DMA, they have the percent of the area, ra area racism. It's a very small study, but it has huge effects. We have a 4% increase in heart disease, 2.6% increase in cancer, 3% increase in stroke, no effect with diabetes. I've actually found this effect with diabetes in a number of my studies. There's, diabetes doesn't work the same way that other diseases do. And it may be because diabetes is a gateway disease to other types of mortality risk. All right, so you might need some other things in a model to really understand uh, what's going on with diabetes. So in these prior studies, you have a basic model. You select the sample to which you want to generalize. You stratify the population by racial status if you can. Um, you, for, for each of these population stratum, uh, this is a, a subpop, basically. Uh, you create a variable that holds the mean of an independent variable of, the, of interest for that stratum. I'm really referring to the Lukacho, Lukacho uh, st uh, study here. Uh, because the, the area racism study works more so like an ecological study. Um, but here is, uh, I'm going to show you some funky things that you can do to make these study, these measures very easily. First, you create indicators of each group, group one, group two. You interact, um, you create a, 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 you sort the variable by state and by strata. Strata will have two values. Where one value will, will be group one, the second value will be group two. And then you create by sort the state. I'm, I'm in stata right now. I'm sorry. Blech. I'm in stata. I'm not in R. I'm not in SAS or SPSS or anything else. Um, and you create a, a mean of denials, for instance. And then you do an interaction term. Um, and then you replace any time that interaction term is for the other group, you replace it with a missing value. If you don't do this, it's going to create Z, it's going to actually create a mean when you collapse a variable, when we collapse this data set down to the state level, it's going to create means that include the zero that you created from the, the interaction term. So you have to create that missing variable. It, when, you, when you use a term, collapse is basically my wonder drug. When I found collapse, everything changed. Because I was literally over here creating just like this, N1, N2, N3, N4, N5, 10, 50 states, variables. It was ridiculous. So um, like I said, the state gets better much faster than I do. Uh, and so I just lean on other people sometimes. Um, but one of the things that we have really not explored at all, most of the research that's out there focuses on the mean, the mean value most research doesn't focus on any other type of descriptive statistic. But in fact, you can impute meaning from other types of descriptive statistics. For instance, if you have a highly skewed population, um, a highly skewed variable, the median is going to be very different from the mean. You can also look at specific types of percentile thresholds, or you can look at the standard errors. The standard errors is going to tell you how different the values within the group are from each other. All right? 
is going to tell you whether that mean is true. All right? So I've been working on that kind of stuff in my, uh, what is it, my free time? I don't know about that, but <laughs> let's, go, let's, go, let's go with it. So I, I talked about this already, the second one, the multiclinarity problem. Um, employment, this is just an example. Employment and job status from the Lukacho sto uh, uh, study, they're highly correlated. You can't put them all in the same model. Um, you can already tell that the research that's been out there is very macro. It's states, it's cities, um, it's designated uh, uh, metro, uh, metro, uh, market areas. Um, there are uh, hospital service areas, uh, community tracking service, uh, sur survey uses, um, I'm, I'm sorry, community trust survey uses uh, hospital service areas. Um, but most people don't go below that. And, and there are reasons for that. Number one, there are not very, uh, there's not a lot of really good uh, city level or below the city level studies out there. They're very expensive. At the time that PhDCN, I mentioned that again, it's a project on human development in Chicago neighborhoods. It gave me my dissertation, so gave me my PhD, so I have to say it over and over again. Um, PhDCN was the, the number, was the highest funded study by NIJ when it was funded. It was almost a billion dollars to fund that study. They, there's no, people are not paying out, the government ain't giving y'all no, no billion dollars. Sorry. So you have to figure it out. All right, there's a lot of, uh, that's one of the reasons why people mostly, mostly are using probability samples and geocoding them. Um, but the one that I did not talk about, which is really important, and I didn't realize how important it was until I really left the end of my dissertation stage, which was a long time ago, by the way. Um, I'm actually uh, through the tenure process, so I'm, you know, I'm <laughs> past. Um, I was like, this was just, it feels like yesterday, but it just wasn't yesterday, sorry. Um, but the main reason why I think that uh, we are kind of off the market with regards to our structural measures of racism is that it does not take into account within area or sub-area sources of variation in the variable you're predicting. So that's where we're gonna stay for the rest of the semester, well, sorry, the rest of the, <laughs> rest of the day. We're gonna talk about three different ways to account for variation within a structural variable, or what people have been calling a structural variable. Um, so people have been up here, nation states, people, have, I've, done, I've seen some really cool studies out here, uh, states and so on and forth. I'm within the circle. I'm at the meso level. And I'm looking at differences mostly between three groups, black, Latinos, and whites. Uh, we'll stick with, uh, I'll just show you the, the I, I, what I do is I use a minority versus white difference. Um, there was a good reason to do this uh, when I was first doing my research in Chicago. I think there's increasingly a reason not to do this uh, because the populations are becoming more and more distinct, primarily because of the racialization of Latinos. Um, and so we need to be careful about how we create these measures. But for right now, people let me get by with it, probably because they just haven't seen stuff like this before. So I get away with a lot of things. All right, we're gonna talk about the neighborhood redlining. Who doesn't know what redlining is? All right, I'll just talk about a really small for, so we're all on the same page. And then I'll talk about three methods. The fixed effects method, the random effects method. method. Those two are, are validated within the literature. And I'm gonna show you some new stuff, which is the mixed effects method, which is what I've been calling the counterfactual, counterfactual method. Uh, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you why I call it a counter, why I started calling it the counterfactual method and why I no longer call it the counterfactual method. I call it the mixed effects method. All right. <clears throat> then we're gonna use, we're gonna go back to the aggregates, but I'm gonna use count-based aggregates because uh, they're a little bit more flexible than um, all the uh, bi-state, straight up, equals, egen, equals, whatever, um, you can basically create any kind of disparity that you, that you want to if you know how to 
manipulate counts. Um, and I'm going to use these aggregate measures as a validation tool to see what our first three methods are actually producing. So one of the things that happened in the first two methods, this is the G method, this is the Mendez method, this is my method, um, is that nobody validated those two methods. All right. So redlining simply refers to the refusal um, either of loans. Uh, this could be in many kind of loans. It could uh, also include like um, auto loans um, or personal loans. But most people don't do work like that so much because you don't have neighborhood data on that. Um, or insurance. So the refusal of insurance as well to someone because they live in an area deemed to be a poor financial risk or because they are deemed themselves the applicant to be a poor financial risk. So this can occur at the neighborhood level or it can occur within neighborhoods, okay? Um, what I will tell you <clears throat> is that everything that's been published before is focused on the racial disparity within a neighborhood. The work that I published um, in the sociology of race and ethnicity looked at both types of redlining. And it also looked at redlining as an exclusionary act and redlining as an inclusionary act. And I'll talk about what I mean by that a little bit later. Um, so the first index that was created was out of Los Angeles. It was an Asian versus white index. Um, and the second one was out of Philadelphia. It was a black white index. The third one, the Sociology of Race and the City paper, is a, for, out of Chicago, and it's a minority white index. And I did look at whether there were differences between blacks and Latinos in housing discrimination um, that were meaningful, and there are. So that's another paper to be written. Not today, though. Um, the loan criteria that you do, you eliminate a bunch of applications. Basically, you, you eliminate all this stuff, and all you get at the end are originated, denied, purchased loans for the purchase of an owner-occupied one to four family unit. When did, when, I, I don't know if many people know what the term, what this means by a purchase loan, but this is basically a loan that an um, institution bought from another institution. Now, there is data within the, uh, the Home Mortgage and Disclosure Act, which is the policy that required these types of information be collected, that also allows you to identify whether a purchased loan was then sold within the same calendar year, or whether an originated loan was sold. So what you're able to capture, when I talk about this a little bit more tomorrow, is the dual mortgage market. So we have much more than whether you got access to or you didn't get access to. But we're actually able to characterize what quality of loan you have. Why would you sell a loan if you are a bank? Why would you sell a loan? Say the first, who said it? The risk, the credit risk. It's a, who said the second one? You started going in. Recapitalize. To recapitalize on the interest. Money, money, money. Now, there's a relationship between the two, the thing, two things y'all said. Loans that have a higher credit risk make you more money in the short term. But those loans have a higher likelihood of default, so you're trying to make as much money in as little amount of time. That's what led to the, the financial crisis of 2008 to 2010 and uh, the collapse of the economy. They basically was homes that were uh, bought where people had poor credit histories, but they started to sell those loans in bunches with other loans that had really good credit histories. So you couldn't really tell when these loans were being purchased that it was a bad loan. So if you bought the loan and you realize when you open up the package and you're like, wait a minute, I got D, D minus loans in here. C plus loans in here, and maybe a little bit of A, you sell off the C's and the D's, you make your money off of it in a couple of 12 months and then you sell it off. And it increases and increases, it's called the financialization process. There's way too much information for you today, but if you want to read more about it, you should just pick up either the sociology of race and ethnicity piece, um, 
or I have an older piece of, in 2015, it was not in a book chapter. I talked a little bit about the dual mortgage market. Um, these are the steps we're gonna go through today. We're not gonna do, I've already downloaded the data. I created an executable state of file to clean the data according to ICPSR. But I will walk you through a little bit of, of this part where you actually are creating the, the census track level variables. I'm going to replicate the prior research, so they're not going to have the same model across. Um, when I say model, they're not going to have the same model covariates across studies because they didn't use the same models in those studies. But what I'm trying to do right now is just establish whether we actually do see the same patterns in Philadelphia. And this is going to be uh, the Philadelphia Metropolitan Division, which is five different uh, counties, including Philadelphia Books. Uh, I can't remember all of them now. Montgomery keeps going after me. I introduce a new method and then I compare the methods. So as you can see, the covariates that were used in uh, the, the studies, the only one that was the same across the studies was the race status of the applicant. Um, in the bivariate risk models, where you're just comparing two groups to the other, there's no covariates. In these other two models, there are different types of covariates, but in fact, there is a um, the ratio of loan requests to applicant income equals the loan request variable divided by the applicant income variable. So uh, it's kind of hard to say they're not the same, but I did run everything. I'm not going to show you everything. I just don't have the time. Um, and I can tell you it's not about the covariates that are in the model. It's about the model itself. It's about the effects the fixed effects, the random effects, or the mixed effects. I like that sound. I'm going to run a much more robust model uh, because when you do fit statistics, it shows that, in fact, some variables that were dropped in the G model actually are, diff are they actually do matter for Philadelphia, at least. Um, some variables that were in uh, the original Mendez model don't matter, at least now. The, the Mendez model was 1999 to 2004 census tracts. This is the 2013 Honda. So this is after the reform. All right, so we, I do expect uh, Philadelphia to be different. I do expect all of the mortgage markets to be different after the recession. And in fact, uh, Mendez actually noted there was differences in, in the race gap across time coming up into the recession, but she didn't look beyond 2004. Uh, one more thing. Uh, every, everywhere you see CT here, uh, there's a, uh, these are variables that are provided by Humda. They're actually used uh, by uh, the HUD to evaluate whether this institution is being discriminatory. So there are minority percent. There is a percentage of the tracks median income to the MSA's median income. And then the number of owner-occupied units. Um, make sure I remember all this stuff real quick. Uh, all three of these variables are going to have an interaction term with minority status. That's actually uh, the real big difference between what I do and what Mendez does, since we're both working in the same city. But there are also very, very big differences in what we're doing. Um, I'll, I'll leave this up here so you know you take a picture of it or whatever you want to do, because this is the basics, right? But I'm going to go walk you through the, the three models really quick. So in the fixed effects model, what you do is you compute a logistic regression model uh, with loan denial, with covariates for race, and loan, to, loan request to applicant income ratio, you cluster the standard areas uh, errors by area, which is, in this case, census tracts. But if you were using a different area, you would use a different area. So I use neighborhood clusters in Chicago because they wouldn't give me the census tract identifiers. You know, you do the best that you can. Um, then you compute a predicted value for all persons that are in the sample. And then you create the interaction terms for all racial groups both minoritized groups and whites. Then a redlining odds ratio is created by dividing predicted values 
for minority, minoritized groups by predicted values for whites. Um, in his case, what he did, he didn't stop there with the odds ratio. As a matter of fact, he actually never used the odds ratio itself. He used a dichotomized odds ratio of uh, area having 1.4 uh, odds ratio or more. So that meant that Asians were 40% or more likely to be denied than whites. So if you were 39% more likely, if Asians were 39% more likely to be denied than whites, that was not considered discrimination. This ratio that he got he comes from the housing discrimination literature. As an in indicator of a neighborhood, primarily uh, of poverty levels. So he's uh, extending something that may not really, really work, but there was nothing else really out there at the time, so you run with it. Um, I think the threshold is one reason why he found what he found. Um, I also think he found what he found because he was studying Asians versus white differences, which are of a different type than uh, black, and, black versus white or Latino versus white differences. And I think he found what he found because he was studying in Los Angeles, which even back then, uh, his, his data was in 1994 to 1995, uh, Los Angeles was a really expensive place to, to live, way more than uh, Philadelphia at that time or Chicago. Um, so here's some log output. You have the cluster here for the tract. Um, let me see what else you can sh show you here is fun. Uh, you have 979 clusters in a track. You're not losing any data with this skinny of a model. Uh, you're just putting the race difference. There's a, um, hold up, this is a code. These are the logic coefficients. Let me show you one more. This is the odds ratio uh, in Philadelphia running the same model that G ran. Uh, minorities were 2.8 times more likely to have loans denied than whites. Um, every uh, one unit increase in the loan to in the, the loan to income ratio was linked to an 11 percent increase in denials. Uh, so the more loan you ha you had on your plate compared to your income, the more likely you were to be denied. Um, he in his original model also included gender of the applicant uh, and co-applicant minority status but they were not significant. I can tell you uh, co-applicant minority status is not significant in Philadelphia. Uh, gender, gender is significant, but under certain, certain contingencies. Um, when you look at, just looking at the, this is basically what you're doing. You're predicting if you're in the sample, put the PR at the bottom uh, or the end of it, you're gen generating, uh, the minority measures um, with interaction terms, the white measures with an interaction term. Um, what you find here is something that should start to give you a little bit of a problem. You see an almost one-to-one -one relationship between uh, the minority probability of denial and the probability of denial. What does that tell you? I want to throw this at somebody. Hold up. I've been wanting to do this all day. All right, put this down. Who's gonna hold up the hand? What does this tell you? Hold up. <laughs> oh. Minorities get denied almost all the time. Minorities are the main ones being denied in that neighborhood. Yes. In all neighborhoods almost, because you're using all 979 tracks. Um, you also see uh, a negative relationship uh, between um, the white probability of denial and the probability of denial, which suggests that you're going to have uh, really strong racial, racial differences. Um, so after you do that, you collapse the, 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 the variables by tract. Um, you create the odds ratio for denials by dividing the minority rate divided by the, the, the um, white rate for denials. 
you create the high index by saying that if the odds ratio is more than 1.4, if it's not less than missing. Um, this is what I use in, the, the, in, in my study in 2016. I actually use the median values because in, in, I just couldn't find a good threshold. I tried 75%, 25%, uh, and then 50% just because I just wanted enough variation on both sides of the fence. Um, at least in Chicago, that number, the median value is very close to one. Uh, so, you know, it kind of doesn't, it, it has the same meaning as this last one, which is it indicates a minority disadvantage, anything ab above one. So what you're doing this, another thing to, fo to follow here, um, I can share with you the do files in which I did all of this so that you can see it for yourself. But this is being ran. So this model, this part of the equation or part of the syntax file included all 35,936 people in Philadelphia who are included in the sample. And if I were a betting person, I would have actually said this should be, um, no, 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 this is fine. Uh, this is fine, because uh, you're predicting it to the individual. Oh, let me just say one more thing here. Uh, I'm sorry, here. So the only source of variation of the, of the at the neighborhood level is this ratio. That's why you're getting all of these differences that you see between the 35,936 people, because each of them are coming into the mortgage market with a different ratio. Also, different neighborhoods have different ratios. But his, his, his um, model, sorry to go back and hurt your, your eyes, doesn't account for the impact of the neighborhood on um, the loan income. There is some, there is a, there's an adjustment that clustering does, but it's not enough. If you've ever run an HLM model and compared it to a cluster model, you'll, you, can, you, can see, you can see differences in the, the beta coefficients primarily for individual level covariates. And these are the, very, the, the, the covariates that are driving this predicted uh, fixed effects method. And they're not basically, they're not properly adjusted for the multi-level nature of the data or at least the nested, I would say the nested nature of the data. <clears throat> so you're starting off with 35,000 people, and what you can do is you can preserve the data set. So hold the 35,000 people over here, start a new analysis where I collapse it down to 979 tracks, run through all of these cool different metrics, met uh, uh, metrics save the data set, which is this is only a data set of 979 tracks. And then I'm going to join this, this data set back into the 35,000 at the track level. So join by is my second wanderlust. Got to have it. Got to go on vacations with it. I go on vacations with join by. There was only one vacation that I didn't do work on was when I went to St. Martin's. That was a very beautiful place. So it was, you know, I brought my computer though. I had intentions. So that's the fixed effects model. And you can see right off the bat why it's problematic if we're really talking about neighborhood level measures of discrimination or area level measures of, or, uh, measure of discrimination or organizational level measures of discrimination. The random effects model fixes some of this. So what's happening here Besides the fact that the covariates are different, you're including for beta 1j, which is the estimate for the impact of the race of the applicant status, you're including a random effect, u sub, sub 1j. That's a random effect. What we're gonna do, I'm gonna show you a bunch of stuff and it might scare you, but it shouldn't scare you. I will tell you it will take a while to run on your computer is this, this model itself takes, this is a very skinny model, but it still takes a long while to run on your computer. And it's only 35,000 people. I mean, seriously. Number two, 
when you try to pull out these random effects, what I'm trying to say by that is when you try to isolate the random effect from everything else in the model, the intercept, the fixed effects for race of, uh, of, of applicant, gross, effect, gross annual income fixed effect, loan amount fixed effect, sex of applicant uh, fixed effect, her words, not mine, and the random intercept for the constant, when you try to isolate that random effect for the slope, you ever heard that term, the slope? Random slope models? All right, that's what you're running here. When you try to do that, it is very tedious for your computer. Just letting you know that ahead of time. But if you have patience and a very lo a lot of computer speed, you can do it too. What she's going to pull from here are the uh, uh, the posterior. She's pulling the posterior means because she's using um, SAS. In Stata, you can only get the posterior modals, um, which is mean versus mode. It's, uh, there are some different, there are differences, but it's, it's not consequential to the study. Uh, your 52 level regression with a fixed effect for key applicant characteristics, a random intercept, and a random slope for minority status. And you use the post estimation commands to extract the random effects for the slope from the model using empirical based inference techniques. Now there are other things you can pull from this model, and it was actually when I started pulling those other things from the, those models, when I started to understand what the counterfactual model really was doing, um, or what I call the counterfactual model was doing. Then you transform the random effect, because what the random effect comes out in is as a, uh, a logic coefficient. That's what it comes out as. So you need to transform it back into an odds ratio using EXP, uh, the natural log of the random effect. Then you can do all your dichotomizations by whatever threshold you want to do. All right. So this one is a little bit more money in it than the last one. Same people, same neighborhoods, different set of covariates. You see that in this random slope model, applicant income is not significant and gender is not significant. But you do have uh, significant uh, random effects for minority status and a constant. Um, here, the Odds ratio for the racial gap goes down a little bit to 2.59. Um, you have, this is in loan amount, this is in thousands of dollars, so this needs to be transformed. Um, same, the same thing with applicant income. Um, but loan, the, 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 the loan amount to applicant income ratio was not significant in this model, at least for Philadelphia using this model. Gender also wasn't a differentiator for this model, okay? Uh, so this is what it looks like. You predict, um, you have to name them. So I put EB underscore, this is my name. You can put any name you want to put it, test, test one, test two. But I put EB underscore uh, asterisk. And if you put asterisk, it will basically compute a variable one, two, three, four, five, as many random effects that you have in your model. If you have a random intercept, three random slopes is going to give you four different empirical base estimates. Uh, so the first thing that you get out is this empirical base estimate for the slope. The second one that you get out is, uh, is an empirical base estimate for the constant. Um, and you can, so I did it, this is what you're supposed to do here. You're supposed to select, so there's a, basically you you can identify the first respondent from every census tract because if you're doing your census tract variables right, this is at the census tract level. This is not at the individual level. Random effects, random intercepts are at the census tract level. What that means for us, at least, is that you don't want to identify the descriptive statistics for 35,000 people. You're going to get uh, some type of uh, skewedness in the data but you want to identify it for the number of census tracts that you can. Now, why is it that you have 979 census tracts in your model, but only 963 show up with empirical base estimates? What's a natural log of zero?
Is it one? What's the natural log of? Oh, all right, I got it. Sorry, I'm going off. I'm going off script. All right. So if you don't have a my, <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, is it one? Well, no, that actually, I had that in my script, but it goes a little bit later. Sorry. I'll bring it back up why that matters. It's undefined. I knew I was right. Stop playing with y'all, man. Shoot. This is why you got to trust yourself. The reason why is because you have 16 different census tracts that have zero, that they're right at the median. There's no difference. So, um, these values right here tell you the ranking of a census tract from the median or the mean. If you're in stated, they tell it from the, from, the, from, the, from the mode or it's really the median. Um, so there are some census tracts that are right, on, right at zero. They get dropped. They just get dropped. So if you don't go back and do something to them, you're not gonna have them in your analysis. All right, so you have to either set them at point oh, 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 one, so you get a little bit of something out of them, or point oh, oh, negative point oh, 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 one. But they have to have a real value. They can't be zero. All right, just showing up what's going on. Anyways, here's the odds ratio right here, exponentiated uh, odds ratio. Uh, you lose even more when you exponentiate. Um, now this is, we're here, we're, we are still in the sample, so this is 903 people um, that you're missing, but you're gonna miss out if you, when you start losing people, you start losing the number of people that can be compared. Now this is something that you don't have a problem with when you're using the mixed effects model. It's also something you don't have a problem with when you use a fixed effects model. So there's some things you get with fixed effects that you can't get with random effects, some things you get with random effects that you can't get with fixed effects. Now, I'm going to stop here before I go too much further because I want you to try to think about why would there be a difference between fixed effects and random effects, odds ratios. They're supposedly capturing the same thing. Let's assume that they have the same covariate structure. They don't, but let's assume they have it. When I tell you that the correlations between the fixed effects and the, the random effects models are below moderate, correlations, we're not talking about things that are even really related to each other. They're very different. And essentially what you're, you're assuming, um, let me uh, skip this for the sake of time. Um, when you run the fixed effects model, all right, you assume that all the differences between the neighborhoods is a function of individual characteristics. That's a theory of discrimination. All right, over here, when you're running a random effects model, what are you assuming? That all the differences between the neighborhoods are not a function of individual characteristics. You are wiping away all the individual characteristics. Well, I don't know if that's a really functional definition of discrimination either. Individuals matter. Institutions do too. So how do we get them to matter at the same time in our model? So I'm introducing to you the mixed effects method. It combines the fixed effects and random effects from G and Mendez respectively. You estimate a model of application risk. You allow for area level fixed effects. So you actually see in our prior models, there was no mention of the minority percentage in the neighborhood, the poverty of the neighborhood, the number of uh, homeowners in the neighborhood. Um, you didn't even know how much glass was on the street in the neighborhood. All right, trying to get y'all to wake up a little bit here. You don't know anything about the neighborhood, but supposedly this is a neighborhood effects measure of institutional racism. So why don't we just throw some of that stuff in there? Well, what happens if you throw that in there in a fixed effects model? What happens? There's, it's the same across individuals within the neighborhood. It gets thrown out. Literally, it gets thrown out. If 
you put in a random effects model, it's now going to run your random effects, slope effects, holding constant everything in the neighborhood. So again, your random slope effect, the empirical base estimate for minority status, is not a function of anything in the neighborhood and not a function of anything in, of, of the individuals in the neighborhood. For me, those are just not realistic theoretical assumptions. Um, you're going to use a post-estimation command and predict, uh, and you're going to compute. Uh, you can do two different kinds, but I like one more than the other. I like the marginal predicted probabilities because it allows for both the random effect of the intercept and the random, a random effect for the slope to be estimated at the same time. See, the other thing we forgot about in the random effects methods is that redlining is not just about identifying applicants who are of poor financial risk. It's also about identifying neighborhoods that are of poor financial risk. So if we are true to the concept of neighborhood redlining, then we should also be having some way to measure neighborhood level differences in loan denial. We can't do that in the random effects method that was put it up there. Um, you, can, you can do it, they just didn't do it. All right, this, that's, I'll just say that. That's the only, only thing about them. I love them, but they just didn't do it. Um, you also can uh, use, uh, predict the predicted probabilities with the random effects set at zero. And if you're like a little methods person like I am, you just compare the two to see what part of the neighborhood uh, variable that you create is a function of individual characteristics versus everything else, the neighborhood. All right, so what is, this is what this model looks like. It's a little more complicated. Um, I have the loan, the ratio in here, the amount of the loan. I have a variable for whether there is a co-applicant or not. So this one is no co-applicant if you're one. Then I put in three different um, census tract level variables, minority population, uh, tract income, tract to MSA income, and owner occupied, occupied total. Uh, have a covariate for minority status, and then I put in interaction terms with all the neighborhood level fixed effects variables. You see at the bottom here, we have a random effects. If I were to change this to FE, right, so I'm running this as XT logit. If I were to change this to FE, this, all of this, bam, all of this will go away. All of that will go away. You can pull models, you can pull them Basically, if you want to study neighbor, neighborhood effects, you have to study random effects. You have to find a way to study random effects. But if you want to understand the relationship between discrimination and um, race, you also need to understand the impact of the individual characteristics. So basically, this is, what, this is the easiest way to, to do this. Uh, I can, I'll tell you the hardest way to do it, which is the way I used to do it. Uh, don't do it that way. Um, do it this way. You do predict um, a, a new variable name, uh, comma, PR. This is your marginal predicted probabilities. And here, when you set the random effects to zero, you're basically turning the random effects off. You're assuming that they don't matter, that neighborhood effects don't matter. There's no neighborhood, neighborhood um, random intercept. There are no neighborhood fixed effects. Actually, you're actually assuming that as well. Um, well, actually, you don't turn the fixed effects for the neighborhood off. So you get all of this, but you, you remove the BOJ. Um, and, you, and you remove, uh, no, no, that's all that. That's for this one, this is the only one you move. Um, you put PUO uh, zero at the, at the end and you're there. Uh, so this is what this model looks like. Uh, I think it's a beautiful model. Uh, there are very few things that are not informing the probability of denial. Uh, when you account for, let me walk you through this model for a little bit, gender becomes significant. Uh, women are less likely to be denied than men. 
Uh, once you account for neighborhood effects that vary by race, uh, the loan ratio uh, increases the likelihood of denial, as, we, as G shows you. The loan amount reduces the likelihood of uh, denial, so jumbo loans, basically, are going to get a little bit more play from institutions than other loans. If you don't have a co-applicant, you're more likely to be denied. Uh, minority population is marginally significant. If I took away the minority effect, uh, minority interaction, it would be significant. But what you find here is that for whites who live in areas, uh, let me see if I can keep that straight here. For whites who live in areas where there are lots of minorities, that does not influence their likelihood of denial. But for blacks who live in areas where there are lots of blacks or Latinos who live in areas where there are lots of minorities, that does increase their likelihood of denial. So here you're showing the double whammy of that uh, redlining model at the neighborhood level and within neighborhoods. Uh, here you see um, higher uh, income per MSA is linked to uh, less likelihood of denial. But that is less of the case. And matter of fact, there's a reverse relationship for minorities. Minorities who live in high income uh, census tracts are more likely to be denied. Well, this is not going to make a lot of sense to you now, but tomorrow it will make some sense because I'll show you some analysis, at least from Chicago, that shows the same very thing. Minorities who are in um, more stable communities are actually more likely to face denial and more likely to face riskier loans than our minorities who live in impoverished communities. Uh, the last one here, owner occupancy, is, in, is significant by itself, but once you account for the minority interaction, for whites, owner occupancy has no effect, but for when there are more owner occupants um, in a neighborhood for minorities, that does reduce the level of denials in that neighborhood. Uh, so that's the model. What you, what you find here is that the main effect within a neighborhood of the fixed effect for minority status is actually no longer significant. Um, now, you can try to, uh, to run a fully interactive model. I was not successful, at least with the HUMDA 2013. I think you probably need a couple more years added together, 20, maybe uh, 11 to 2013, get a bigger data set. Um, but it just never converged, right? So when I say a fully interactive model, how many of y'all know what I mean when I say that? A fully interactive model means I have all of these covariates um, estimated for whites and also all of these covariates estimated for minorities. I remove the minority status indicator and I, wrote, and I run a no constant model. You're going to then put in a constant for whites and a constant for minorities, but they're going to mean different things now. Now, this minority constant or uh, status variable reflects a difference between whites and minorities or between minorities and whites. When you're running a fully interactive model, it now only reflects the race-specific intercept for minorities, the, min, the MIN, and then if you have one for whites, WNL, I say white non-Latinos, that will reflect the intercept for white non-Latinos. All right, then what you can do, you can test the coefficients to see whether they're the same and see if you, uh, see, well, that's actually what I did uh, but with a logit model. And then I found out you know, that we should basically focus on the neighborhood effects and not so much the applicant effects. Anyways, all right, so I'm going to, uh, we're around 930, so I want to show you um, the validations. Uh, so there are some small con conceptual lessons that we need to learn from this uh, th that, we, uh, that we can learn in addition. Exclusion does not mean the presence of inclusion. So you can have exclusion and inclusion disparities, both of them meaning bad things. If, for instance, the loans that minorities get are bad loans, like predatory loans or less regulated loans. Um, the racial disparities index that use a stratum as a comparison group always suffer in severely segregated organizations because they require each group to be present within smaller units of the organization. But that is not going to happen in a highly segregated place like um, Detroit 
or Chicago. There will, be, there will be some neighborhoods where you will not see any minorities, and there will be some neighborhoods where you will not see any other whites. And unfortunately, your models are restricted by your data. All right. Uh, so that's the, uh, I'll tell you about the exclusion part, I'll tell you about the da 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 da. All right, so this is uh, comparing exclusion to inclusion. You see low levels of, of, of com uh, comparison, except for this total risk ratio. I kind of moved over that, but the total risk ratio basically, I uh, think you mentioned it. Uh, you said it's a, basically, it's a, this is a measure, a concrete measure of the percentage of the denied loans that are minorities. Um, it's not the same as percent of all loans that are denied, or that of all loans that are denied for minorities. It's a little different. It goes from zero to one, basically. Um, it goes from zero to one, and then it can go, it can be reversed if, if it, under certain circumstances. So I'll skip that for a minute. But we're gonna use it as a validation tool. So here's the fixed effects, the random effects, the mixed mix effects, and we're gonna compare them to uh, uh, a racial disparity uh, where the total risk ratio is a replacement for any missing variables, one where there's no replacement, and then, re and then uh, re compare it to the total risk ratio itself. So remember, the total risk ratio basically takes the percentage of minority loans that are denied divided by the percentage of all loans that are denied. All right? So that means you always have somebody in the, in the, in the denominator. All right, so the first thing we find is that when we don't have a replacement, we lose too many people, or we lose too many neighborhoods. So this is census track level variables. Um, so this is not a good measure. We, we need to do some type of replacement um, because we have a difference of almost uh, 106 right here. This is a huge difference of neighborhoods lost. Um, these are basically the same neighborhoods in the bottom, in the, the fourth line and the sixth line. What you find here first is that there is a very low correlation between uh, the G model and the Mendez model. So this is a fixed effects model and a random effects model. There's a stronger correlation between the fixed effects model and the mixed effects model, all right? And if you look at the mixed effects model, there's actually a fairly weak correlation with the random effects. And we should actually expect that because now we're actually considering individual level covariates. Um, we're also allowing for uh, neighborhoods to vary by very specific types of, of things, things that we would typically know in the literature are valuable in pieces of information for understanding disparities. So this is a mixed effects model. When we go down here, we start to see um, uh, some a little bit more information. The mixed effects model here is uh, moderately related to the total risk ratio. Um, uh, the total risk ratio, now here you have pretty small numbers, uh, but we do see the relationship. Um, and what we're losing here mainly is uh, because of, of the mixed effects model. The mixed effects model is, is, very, is very demanding. Uh, you need people in pretty much spaced out. It doesn't work so well. Uh, uh, either you need more people in your individual level, so your applicant sample, or you need uh, a less segregated environment. All right, so to cl conclude, um, I want to ask you a question, and maybe we can move this thing around to your friends and your peoples. But I want to know um, um, how, we, we talked about this relationship supposedly between racism, discrimination, and race. Uh, so people have these ideologies of what, who, who, who belongs in which society and how much they should get. Um, because of those things, they act differently towards those members of those group, and they start the social categorization process that results in racialization. Um, how do our uh, new understandings of super-individual racism complicate the purported relationship between racism and race? What do we think is missing in the middle of this? Anybody want to try? That was a stumper. I'm, that's a, it's an honest question. I'm still trying to figure it out myself. It's not funny. So one of the things that's going on here is our understanding of discrimination, even though we identify multiple levels of discrimination, systemic, structural, institutional, we still mostly measure structure, um, discrimination 
at the individual level. It still requires someone to do something. In our models here, the exclusion model assumes that some uh, underwriter is back in the back of the bank and is saying, mm, nope, mm, yeah. And we're assuming that it's happening. There's an individual theory of why, there should be an individual theory of why that is happening. Um, so that person is discriminating, so to, part, so to speak. So even our institutional models still depend on the individual. One of the things that I think that the mixed effects model does, because it allows for um, the minority effect to vary by neighborhoods is that the individual in the back of the bank is not simply looking at the individual that's on that application. They're looking at the area and the individual at the same time. And they're making a judgment call that, you know what, I don't wanna, I don't, I mean, y'all are not from, anybody from Atlanta? Couple people from Atlanta? Atlanta, in, in, the, in the mortgage market in Atlanta, people don't like to uh, provide loans below I-20. I-20 is a east-west divider, goes all the way maybe to about Louisiana or so, um, starts in South Carolina, but below I-20 is almost 85% black. You don't even have to pick a neighborhood. Just say you below I-20. We don't, we don't, there are people, property managers that don't manage properties below I-20. So they, so, so, so houses fall apart and so on and so forth. So we need to think about a, a, a measure of uh, discrimination that is far more sophisticated, I think, than simple an individual's prejudice. Because usually when I say discrimination and racism, what people think is prejudice. But if people in the bank, back of the bank, are looking at an applicant, a neighborhood, and also an applicant and a neighborhood as both separate and together units, then we're not just talking about prejudice anymore. All right, discrimination is an act, but it's also something that's moved by some codes that we're having. We can go ahead and open up to Q&A. Yeah. And I'm wondering if these same type, if you found evidence of these same types of tests being applied uh, by uh, underwriters. And then the question is. Can I, can I get the first one real quick? So the, the question that he's asking is there's a tool called differential item functioning that's used in education, it's used in psychology as well, but it's used to see how two, two different groups use a particular score, uh, a different, like a psychological test or so and so forth, and are those used in studies of mortgage uh, market um, users, or uh, I would say agents. Um, my quick answer is, is no, because the data that we get from mortgage market agents are, is very limited. Unless you are working with the bank itself, or unless you're working with a consumer um, credit um, advisor, you can't get information on credit. You can't get information on debt. I mean, even Humda doesn't have that data, right? And this is a public data set, and it's by law. Um, so there are some data sets, uh, and there were some, some analysis in the early 90s that did some of this stuff. The, the other problem with the differential item functioning is it usually requires you to answer more than three questions. So you only have one indicator here. Did you deny or not? And what I can tell you, there's another type of, of uh, there's another type of method called Ecometrics. Anybody heard of that? Ecometrics? You should just look it up real quick if you're interested in neighborhood effects uh, models. But Ecometrics models uh, require for you to have at least three, they're, they're based off of differential item functioning. They require for you to have at least three different indicators. The random effects model is basically an Ecometric model for one indicator. 
And what I suggest is that it, it really produces a lot of error. What's your second question? When you say market areas, you're referring to the census tracts? Yeah, the, the 970. Okay, and how much of that variation is a result of the? It's between the census. The census tracts. Oh, um, it's about 13 to 14 percent. Uh, so there was, oh, there was, uh, uh, so, so there was a, in, in, the, in the log output that I can show, uh, share with you, there's a, 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 a null model, basically, that shows you what the ICC is, interclass correlation. Any other questions? I know there's more questions, so let me just ask, open it up for questions. Yes. Um, does the, any of the data set have information about the uh, originators of the, of the lenders? Like maybe there's more institutional uh, effects of discrimination from some lenders versus others? And I guess my second question is, um, have you looked at like uh, uh, some of this like variation over time? Like maybe there's in, mm -hmm. you know, like increased or less interaction effects uh, yeah. over time? Uh, so two great questions. You have the mic, so I won't repeat them. Um, so the first question, um, there is a, a data set that comes. So this is called, so you get loan data from what they call the loan application registrar. Mm -hmm. So this is the registrar, when, when you, where you have to register every loan that most commercial banks have to use, uh, most commercial banks originate or purchase within a year. But there's also a transmittal sheet. The transmittal sheet has some information about banks where if you had a bank's basically special code, you can pull in your own information about banks into that data set. One type of information that people have brought into is whether a bank is likely to be a subprime lender. Now, starting in 2004, there's actually a measure of subprime loans. However, uh, they, 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 uh, it's, it's a variable called rate spread. Uh, but by, in 2010, they changed the meaning of the variable. It goes from 3% to 1.5%. And very few people are in that category by 2010. But between, two, talk about your time question, between 2004 and 2009, you had somewhere like 30% of loans that were subprime. And you had a exponential increase in subprime lenders starting in 1997. So I know that at the MSA level, uh, uh, Jason, Jacob Rue and um, uh, Doug Massey have done some analysis showing that there is a relationship between uh, subprime lenders in an area and racial segregation um, and, and loan denial. So there's a relationship all this, that's all in there. Um, but I think there's a lot more opportunity there that we can take advantage of. Um, I will say that I'm doing some analysis across time starting um, in Philadelphia because uh, I, I have a health data set that goes back to 94. Uh, and we go from 94 until 2014, it's about 20 years of data. Um, and we have every year of Humda between, during that. And you can clearly show, I basically show an effect of the boom and an effect of the bust. Right, so a boom in loans and a bust in loans, a boom in subprime loans, a bust in subprime loans, and neighborhoods that that arc was higher, those areas have worse um, health, and that the health is even is even worse for uh, people who are uh, minorities or in minority neighborhoods. But that's a, a bigger uh, that's a book is a book project that I'm working on. In the back, uh, if we can get it passed all the way down there. Oh, you got to pay attention, man. You got. <laughs> You gotta pay attention. Thank you. So my question is a pretty uh, simple one. So in the model, are you assuming that each of the variables are operating in like a one-to-one -one increasing fashion? Because I would think that something like the um, debt to income ratio and denials would be like exponentially higher the worse your debt, debt to income ratio. Oh was. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I've been very simple with it. I've been very uh, linear assumptions about the functional form of the covariates, but I think you're right to assume that there may not be that going on. Um, I will say that uh, the, what you saw, what I showed you was where the literature is at. It's very, very simple models. 
Yes. Anybody in the back? Somebody in the middle over here? Up right here in the front? I'll come down to you. No, I don't I think she'll do shit. <laughs> but you can pass it up. I don't want to hit anybody, so I'm going to just... Tap, tap, tap! <laughs> All right, now. It must be a good question. I'm How just joking. Doing? This is open. It's open. It's, it's, it's recording. Is it? Oh, record. Oh, okay. Yeah, it records. Uh, so when you were talking about the, um, you mentioned it, the fixed and random, I guess, variables from running the test. I can't hear her. I'm sorry. Oh, my bad. Go ahead. Can y'all hear me? No, no, we can't. Use the mic. Does it work? Can y'all hear me now? There we oh, go. Okay, cool. Okay, it does work. Uh, so when you were talking about um, doing the mixed methods test with the fixed and random variables, um, for random, you said it takes out the characteristics. Does it also take out the discrimination? Is that what that means? Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I ain't say nothing about discrimination. Oh, well, okay. See, y'all, you caught it. I never said anything about discrimination. Now, the first two me methods I, told, I talked about, they were purporting to study institutional discrimination. But why would they? Why would we have these positive associations with health? I, I mean, me and Dara have actually been on the phone about this. We were working on a paper together, trying to nail some of this stuff down. Um, we're, we're, we think there's something real there, but we also think that there's something real we're not measuring. So, what is discrimination is highly debated in the field. I can tell you when Gilbert was, um, the fixed effects models, when Gilbert was writing, if you didn't control for individual characteristics, you couldn't assume that anything you found was actually discrimination. So that's where in the literature has evolved where you're always controlling for individual characteristics. Basically what we call compositional effects in the neighborhood effects research literature. Does that make sense? Now me, I actually am not that tied. I mean, I use the term racism, not discrimination, because I'm more interested in resource deprivation and mobility um, hurdles rather than whether somebody was discriminated against or not. Because what I can tell you is that there's very few, it's very unlikely in the Supreme Court that we have today that if I were to create a measure of structural discrimination, that it will fly in that Supreme Court as a measure of actual discrimination. Now in the past, some of these studies have been able to do that. They've been able to identify racial differences in um, the, loan, the loan rate uh, with people with the same debt to income ratio. All right, so this was actually a court case. So Memphis had one, Chicago had one. Um, at least I mean, those are the two places that were successful and uh, they paid damages to the city based on these things. But it's very loose what a court will take. It's all based off of really their own prejudice. Another question right here. Yes. Hi again. Um, so can this method be used for areas that are being gentrified? Yes. What would you anticipate the results would be? Um, Well, I think you will have higher rates of denial for blacks and Latinos in gentrifying areas and lower rates of denial for whites, which means you'll have a larger racial difference, okay? Um, here's the problem with gentrification, all right? When you say people that, gentr that, that are affected by gentrification versus areas that are gentrified, a lot of the people who are affected by gentrification don't live in those areas anymore. So you have to have a measure, you have to have a study of mobility, all right? I will actually say uh, the PhD, if you actually want to study some of this stuff, the Project on Human Development Chicago Neighborhood is actually a really good study to do that because we know which neighborhoods they're in in 94, 97, and 2001, which gentrification went, started skyrocketing during the late 90s in Chicago. 
And you can find out whether a neighborhood, uh, 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 an area has been gentrified by a number of things. Uh, the percentage of whites who have moved into a neighborhood within the last five years. There's a five-year mobility question within the census that you can identify. Um, the number of, of new businesses that have been started, new business applications that have been started. Um, there are some indicators of, of, of um, Zillow has a measure of, of homes that have been sold within the last year uh, that were prior for foreclosures. Oh, everybody just went, hmm, hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's gentrification right there. I can tell you, I live in a gentrified neighborhood in, in, a, in Atlanta, historic West End, and I can see it literally with my eyes every week, okay? Half of this stuff we don't actually measure, but there are some things, Zillow has a data set, uh, Realty Track has a data set, CoreLogix, if you're at the University of Michigan, um, uh, faculty or I think graduate students are allowed access to it, CoreLogix has a great data set, CoreLogix is a data set that appraisers and real estate agents use to uh, price homes. It has a massive amount of data in there that you could use to pull out whether an area is going through gentrification. Good question. All right, I'm ready to go. Uh, pass it on back, maybe a soft toss. You can handle it. All right, yeah, alley-oop, alley <laughs> <laughs> Did you, um, be, because commercial real estate is different from um, real estate one to four units and higher, did you look at, at CRA data for commercial mm. real estate and how that really impacts these communities as well? Because I just think that if you kind of look at that, that aspect, um, you might get a skewing of the data. So when you say CRA, are you referring to the Community Reinvestment Act? Yeah. So when I first uh, did this study, someone asked me that same question. So you know I had to have an answer to it. I didn't have an answer that time, but I found out. Um, so uh, if you, you can um, come up with a measure of CRA uh, banks, banks that are governed by CRA laws, and that variable is linked to uh, lower levels of denial. So the CRA is actually effective. That law is actually effective. But even on commercial real estate? But that's what residential. That's because the Humdays are residential. Right. So we don't have the, I don't have data on commercial real estate. So I wouldn't be able to look at that. But I, what I'm able to look at, though, is in areas where there is more governance by the CRA uh, policy, whether there is lower levels of denial and lower racial gaps in denial in residential uh, units. So there are some limitations there. I got five minutes. Oh, see, see, this is why you don't, you don't cut off early, man, come on. No, I didn't say that, you said that, you said that. <laughs> I heard you, you can talk up, I can listen to you. Mm. The idea that a lot of, so I live in Philly, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the Airbnb is um, owned for, right? They're mm. not owned, they're like, you know, not like something that's easily measured, um, and it's driving rental prices up, mm. and you're pricing uh, graduate students and other lower, well, not lower income, but you know what I mean, things. Yeah, I hear you. I feel bad. I used to Airbnb my apartment in, in Philly. No, serious. Here's a serious answer. Here's a serious answer. Um, so you need to, in order to run after this question, you would need to create a measure of Airbnb. Uh, the area racism measure might be a, a good method to do that. The, the, um, basically, you would have the number of Google searches in the area that include the term Airbnb. Airbnb. So that's, a, that's at a market level area, right? Um, the other way to do it is to do what Airbnb tells you not to do which is to literally go on Airbnb and see, you know, the number of Airbnbs in a zip code. The data is right there. You can scrape the, data, you can scrape the internet for this stuff. 
Um, so, you know, if you're a customer or you're a potential customer, you have access to the website. So that's not something that's, that's hard to get. Then you would use that measure as a predictor of denials or predictor of subprime loans or predictor of regulated loans um, in your Humda data set, if that's what you're interested in. But you could also use it as a predictor of anything else at the neighborhood level or at the zip code level if we're looking at within Airbnbs, if you're looking at the Google searchers, you're looking at designated market areas. Um, Google will give you more detailed data than designated market areas. They would just charge you a lot for it. So you just got to go get a grant. <laughs> Everything is a grant these days. I feel one more good question coming out of y'all. Please. Well, all right, so I have to tell you the truth. Um, I'm not satisfied with uh, any of the measures, really. Um, until I find a measure that consistently predicts, well, actually, I have found a measure, but that's tomorrow, so you got to come back. Uh, but until I find a measure that consistently predicts poor health, and I mean consistently, across areas, across time, because health is bad for, for black folks, for Latinos, for immigrants. It's, it's bad. It's getting worse. It, despite access to health care, despite uh, ACA, all these different things that are happening, people are still suffering. So until you, I find a measure, a structural measure, or a super individual measure that consistently predu pre predicts poor health, um, I, I'm not going to be satisfied. And I don't think it, it depends on the method. I think it depends on literally the concept that you're predicting. So when I talked about this one, what I found, and now this is just a, peak for, a preview for tomorrow, I, what I found was that this measure here in Chicago was a much stronger predictor of, of uh, poor health among children than the loan denial, than any loan denial measure. And I've actually found the same thing in Philadelphia. Um, it's troubling because we thought that we, with this, you thought that you had made it. You thought that if you got the loan, you were done. Everybody could go home, we are happy. We've, we've run the race, we've done what we're supposed to do. We made the income we were supposed to get. We got our credit together. We got our debt together. We got in. And then it's not enough. The problem here is that whether, and I'll talk more about this tomorrow, whether a loan is private or public, you won't even know. You don't know who your loan is sold to in the end. So you, you can sometimes figure it out based off of your credit score, I mean your credit history, but if it's sold more than once or twice, you won't know. So you could be having a public loan, which public loans are in my, they're, in some cases, they're associated with bad health. So other cases, they're associated with good health. But a private loan is a loan that is less regulated by the federal government. Those loans are more likely to be among sub subprime lenders. That is my 9 o'clock bell. Do we have any burning questions? And otherwise, I would like you all to go home and get some rest. <laughs>